Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. Alex and I bouncing off the balls because we have an awesome guest for you guys. Who have we got, Alex? <laughs> this is brilliant. And if we don't know, because we've already been on the phone for half an hour. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's Emma, yay! And the summer's Bye. back. Oh, we miss her so much because Emma's been poorly. And I've missed you. Sucks. We've missed you so bad. But I'm back now. You um, are, because your book is out. Yay! My book is out. Yeah. How many fucks did you get put down to in the end by the editor? But in the English edition, the UK and um, Australian edition, I think there's 54, and it went down to 19 for the Americans. Ugh. What? Oh, censorship. <laughs> Don't like it. Elena, what is the book? Oh, so the book is called, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you go and buy it because I've read it. It's awesome. I love it. I've also pre-ordered a copy for my best mate who will get it by tomorrow, by the way, even though we're pre-recording this. So this is not, you know, breaking any sort of like, oh my God. <laughs> anyway, so the book is called A Fatal Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, Murder in Ancient Rome. So we're going to be talking about murder. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Because we've wanted to talk about this for ages, but we didn't want to annoy your publishers by um, <laughs> before it was actually buy-worthy. But now it is buy-worthy and doing mm-hmm. really well and getting only positive reviews online. Um, yeah. We're going to talk all about it. Before we start, Alina wants to share something with the room. So else. I purposely hasn't, haven't told this anecdote to Alex because... I know she's going to laugh at me. So it's to do with, I mean, we could have talked about Caesar. I know everybody wants to talk about his assassination, but do you know what? It's a whole different separate podcast. We want to learn something different, something new, some really cool stuff that Emma's put into the podcast. Anyway, so a couple of years ago, I went and um, had my blood taken just after the Ides of March. And as the nurse was sticking me with a needle, I was like, well, uh, too bad it's not the Ides of March. It could be stabbing me. And she looked at me with this blank expression on her face. And I was like, Wow, that's an epic fail. <laughs> oh, you are such a nerd. <laughs> she probably went home and was like, I had this bizarre person today who was wanging out the date. <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't know what the Ides of March were and she didn't get the stabbing joke, so oh, never mind. Did you have to explain it to her or did you just back out of the room like a loser? I couldn't back out the room. I had a needle stuck in my arm. <laughs> So I tried to save myself just a little bit, but it didn't work. Never mind. Moving on. Anyway, (laughs) murder. Not that you're dwelling on it. Yeah, not that you're, like, not going to let it go. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm like you to hold a grudge, she says, laughing. (laughs) 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 Grudges are what me and Alina do best. Okay, define murder for us. So under Roman law, Emma, um, what do they class as murder? And does it change at all between the Republic and the Empire? Uh, under Roman now. law, they do not class a lot as Roman as murder. Um, they are spectacularly uninterested in people killing people in the streets or in their homes or in their private lives. They're only really interested if you have killed somebody who happens to be a politician or um, very famous for some reason. So for almost all of Republican Roman history, um up until Sulla becomes dictator in the 80s BCE, um, there is nothing which says that murder is illegal or that you shouldn't do it according to the state, basically. It is technically not a crime um, for a lot of Roman history. And then Sulla comes in in the uh, the 80s and gets made dictator um, in order to put an end to the civil wars that he started because he's good like that. Um, (laughs) What a chap. Yeah, um, and he introduces what is called the first murder law, um, but it is very, very specific, and it is basically says you're not allowed to um, bribe a jury or bribe a judge to um, pass a penalty of death. You're not allowed to try to interfere with a trial in any way that might end up with someone being executed as a result. Um, you're not allowed to poison people um, and you're not allowed to stab people in the street or go walking around in the street with a knife with the intention to harm somebody. Um, so very specific um, things that they are legislating against. And it's basically because there's been almost 100 years of civil war and people are taking out their recriminations on one another in the street, basically. Um, well, there's so many jokes I could make about Croydon right now. Let's, <laughs> let's move on. It basically is like 
as far as sort of gang warfare, because they had this war between Marius and Sulla um, that went on for a really long time, and then Marius died, but the war still went on, and Sulla eventually won, but everybody in Rome, everyone who was important in Rome had taken a side, basically, and everybody had a generation's worth of, um, or a decade's worth of kind of gripes and... Um, and grudges to hold against people on the other side that they were then using the law courts and sneaky ways to get their revenge against each other and then going backwards and forwards essentially um and it was kind of making rome a difficult place to live in so he introduces this law to legislate against very specific types of of um of violence um and then that's basically it uh it's not really ever officially there's never a law that's like in the way that there is in modern law in like british law or american law that says you are not allowed to kill somebody ever (laughs) um if you as an individual kill another individual then that then you will be punished for it um and that that is broad and applicable to various circumstances they're only ever very specific and then later on as you get into the imperial period um where it becomes more important that the state has or the government has power um over life and death and that other people don't uh it is that's when you start getting individual laws that are like don't kill people who you have enslaved willy-nilly um don't try to kill each other like more but again they're kind of piecemeal bits and pieces um there is never a until the christian period um when you get to constantine uh which is way late and oh, then much. you've got thou shall not kill yeah and you start to get like constantine um introduces the first law which specifically says you're not allowed to kill enslaved people um and it does go on for about a page of ways in which you're not allowed to kill people um a whole page it's really long it, like in a way that suggests it was having quite a good time writing it down it's like don't throw them off of a cliff don't throw them out of a building don't beat them to death don't set them on fire don't stab them don't, and it just keeps going like this is like brilliant <laughs> scope for turning up in court and going ah oh, but actually see what i did was kill him by basically paper cutting him to death and that's not on your list so you can't yeah do it for it do you um, think we could do a podcast of just you reading this whole list? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, technically, it probably wouldn't be that long, but yeah. Um, you might get a bit bored after a while. Also do the really good, there's a really good law which sometimes gets brought up as a murder law, which is about, um, is really a property damage law. But in there it has loads and loads of examples of ways in which um, an enslaved person could be killed and whether or not the person who killed them would have to pay compensation. So it's got all kinds of things like if you were a person, if you were an enslaved person and you were having being shaved at a barber's by the side of the road and across the road someone was playing with a ball and then they got knocked over by a cart and that cart meant that they knocked the ball and the ball hit the barber and then the barber cut the person's throat. Who's responsible? <laughs> Who I'm is just going to do what all other Chelsea fans do and blame Torres. <laughs> almost certainly him. <laughs> yes, almost certainly Fernando Torres' is fault. So there's plenty of scope then, isn't there, for you to find, clearly... Yeah, ancient Rome. Alina, you so you already said you don't want to do like Julius Caesar on this, do you? You want to focus on new exciting stuff. Yeah, so we um so actually Emma writes in her book that she's got a favourite Roman. <laughs> um I think Linda's gonna love this part because you're gonna talk to us about Cicero, but it's not Cicero. So first of all, tell us who was Publius. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, we all knew it was coming. <laughs> Sorry. We knew it was um, coming. Never mind. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> moving on. Clodius Pulcher. So, Pul- Clodius Pulcher is one of my top favourite Romans. He is a horrible person in every way. 
Um, and I have this real thing where I really like Romans that are horrible. <laughs> yeah, just embrace the fool. Yeah, they just really awful. go. Like people who really, like people who I would hate in real life, I love them in the past. Um, and he just really embraces chaos. Um, anyone who loves Cicero will hate, hate Clodius because he is kind of Clodius's great enemy. He's Cicero's great enemy, sorry. They have this enormous falling out. The reason that they have this falling out is that um, Clodius decides that he wants to find out what happens in this women's only religious ceremony, um, the ceremony of the Bona Dei, who, which is like only women are allowed to go and it's held in the... Um... Did you just say the words Bona Dei? <laughs> Bona Dei, yeah. <laughs> Alex, get your mind out the gutter. You can shut up, man. Twitter's on fire with you and the bees and the scrotums with the ancient Greece thing you did every week. Oops. Um, yeah, so they, um, he decides that he wants to find out what's going on in there. Um, and so he very poorly disguises himself as a woman and breaks into the home of the wife of the head priest, who is Julius Caesar. So he breaks into Julius Caesar's house um basically this- doing little britain like i'm a lady <laughs> really yeah. badly about as convincing as a 1970s like british comedian on the bbc yeah. um, <laughs> but my julius Caesar's house is massive so he gets lost in it really quickly um and then is found by some staff who immediately are like are you Publius clodius vulture <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> So he does. He does never finds out what happens. Instead, he causes a massive scandal because he's done something terrible, broken into someone's house, um, and he has attempted to infiltrate a very sacred and important rite. He's taken to court, uh, um, like you know, lewd behaviour and scandalous behaviour. And his defence is basically like a full shaggy defence, um, which is it wasn't me. Um, it wasn't me. <laughs> Like, that's his entire defence, it's just it wasn't me. And he says, it can't have possibly been me because I wasn't even in Rome at the time. I was somewhere else doing much more exciting things. Um, And Cicero comes forward and says, it definitely was him because he definitely was in Rome because I saw him at dinner that night. Um, And that destroys his defence. And Cicero's a bastard. (laughs) Although, Um, to be fair, it seems like it was a rubbish defence in the first place. In fairness to... Clodius, rubbish defence does not necessarily mean that you won't totally get away with it in Rome. Like, a yeah. reading Roman trial anecdotes. Basically, is, like, everyone's Trump. Yeah, it's so stressful because everyone's like, well, you definitely did do it and you are awful in every way, but we like your dad, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so, he is... Um, found guilty and everything is very terrible he also does just derange things like he um his original name is Publius Claudius Vulture um and his part he was born as a member of this kind of very 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 aristocratic um ancient old money family who have lots and lots of notoriety and are very very famous um and But what that means is that he can't hold one job. There's one job that he can't have in the entirety of the Roman government. So obviously that's the job he wants. Um, So he gets himself adopted by a plebeian family um, and gives up his noble patrician name so that he can become tribune of the plebs, um, basically because he's like a full populist leader who kind of ramps up the people against the nobility um and yeah and he gives up his his nobility which is considered to be genuinely shocking um and becomes Clodius instead of Claudius uh, <laughs> yeah which is not a massive change but <laughs> so um, your yeah. favorite Roman then how does he die I'm assuming he gets murdered he does get horribly murdered. So he um, he's a, a real, uh, what's the word for him? He loves to cause a fight. He loves a fight. And he's a real antagonist of everybody. And he's against Cicero for a really long time. He, like, burns Cicero's house down and introduces a law specifically to get Cicero exiled. Um, 
Which <laughs> again, so many people I'd like to get exiled at least. Yeah, it's people. like he's so furious at Cicero that he beca- he gets himself adopted so he can become tribune of Plebs and he can introduce laws in order to specifically that are specifically aimed at Cicero. <laughs> um, so he um, he does all that and then. As part of his kind of populist campaign, what he does is he starts his own paramilitary. Um, and once he's got one, everybody wants one. So then there's this guy called Milo, who is famous only really for having constant fights with Clodius, um, who also starts his own little paramilitary. And there are these big armed gangs of men and gladiators um, who act in the interests of the person who is paying them. So they are like a personal mini army, essentially. Um, And they're constantly having fights and beating up random bystanders and causing havoc. Um, And one day, they, one is going into the city of Rome and one is going out of the city of Rome and they meet on the street um, and have a wee bit of a, like, what are you looking at? Do you just look at me? What are you looking at? Kind of fight like they always do. <laughs> oh, I had <did laughs> yesterday in Cambridge with an idiot cyclist trying to ride along and yeah, the phone again. was not. But not looking where you're going, no helmet on, in the middle <laughs> of the road, reading your phone, riding with one hand. And then when you toot them, yeah, it does all that. I'm like, well, let me tell you something about how I don't have a problem because if you <laughs> run over, the world will be a better place. But anyway, back to... Imagine the- if, like, that woman also worked with you and had, like, 50 people um, that had massive swords and clubs and things. Um, <laughs> and you also <laughs> have massive swords and clubs and things. And the two of you are constantly running into each other at your place of work and also on the street. Um, <laughs> Sounds like me and Alex a little bit. <laughs> much, yeah. Um, so what happens is they have a kind of very standard, what is a really a very standard, like, yeah, all right, all right, all right, like kind of clash um, where people kind of shake their swords at each other. But it gets a bit out of hand. And one of Milo's gladiators stabs um, Clodius in the back, which is a massive escalation of what has occurred um, previously because it was normally like four people dying, not 50 people dying, which people aren't really supposed to die. Um, and Milo kind of panics when he hears what has happened and he thinks... If I get pulled up in court on the basis that I, like one of my gladiators, so basically me, has a, a, assaulted Clodius, then I'm definitely going to lose. But if I kill him, then I reckon there's a chance I'll get away with it. Brilliant <laughs> like, logic. <laughs> like there's like it's one less witness, basically. <laughs> um, so he has Clodius stabbed to death and left by the side of the road. Um, where another senator finds him riding back into Rome um, and is like, oh, shit, um, and takes his body into Rome where the people are absolutely up in arms because the main thing that Clodius did during his lifetime was introduce the corn doll. Um, so he was the person who introduced the fact that every single right person in Rome um could got a, a an amount of corn a day, which meant that they had bread every day, which meant that nobody ever had to be hungry again. Okay. Um. So he's basically he had he is the person who brought in the end of of, of starvation in the city of Rome, essentially. Um, so he actually that, did something good, didn't he? He did, yeah. Not necessarily out of the goodness of his heart, but um, he did do that very good thing. And he was beloved amongst... He was not beloved amongst senators who thought that this was terrible. But um, amongst the people who he had helped, he was beloved for that reason. So they took his body to the Roman Forum, the main one, um, and laid it out in front of the Senate House and then um, set a pyre. So they set his, they cremated bodies. So they set his pyre using benches from the Senate House and burnt the Senate House down. Okay, that's possibly a slight overreaction. Possibly, but it is quite a big deal that one guy killed another guy um, and killed him specifically. Like he was, like they really loved him quite a lot. Um, And he was like to them and to people who aren't in the, 
um, like the circles of Roman gentry and aristocracy. He is this hilarious lad who is constantly doing comedy stuff and annoying Cicero, which is funny. Um, and Any, anyone that annoys Cicero is amazing in my books. Exactly. Um, and I feel the, sort of the same way because there's something about Cicero that makes you really want to bully him. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk more about everyday people um, and get out of that like little mad world of senators and stuff. Let's talk about more generally like fathers killing their children because you've got some seriously disturbing yet interesting accounts. In your <laughs> I do. That's because the, there's this whole thing that um, Roman fathers had the right to kill their children and if you open any like book for a general audience or, or children um, on that kind of on Romans and that always comes up that they have the power of life and death over their children um, like so, some kids around here could do with that <laughs> so I kind of looked into it and they're like the reason that you find that is because you've got loads and loads of examples from like the Roman distant past so Romans writing about their own distant past saying look at all these people who sacrificed their sons basically because their sons were badly behaved so the, the idea is if your son or your child somehow um offends you or the state in some way then you can honor kill them essentially it's basically what it is no one ever says this for some reason but it's effectively an honor killing like in order to protect the honor of your family you can kill your kid um and so you get these examples like there's this very famous one um with a uh girl who is she's kind of 13 14 years old um and one of her dad's friends takes this real liking to her and wants to marry her and he says no so he comes up with this amazing plan um which is that he will accuse her of being a runaway slave um and then he will take her into his household and then he will have her that way essentially so she's on like pootling along on her way to school and the these guys come out and they're like, this girl is my slave, she belongs to me, she's run away, she's mine, and make a big fuss, and she gets snatched off the streets, um, and then there's a whole court case about it, um, and no, just, like, apparently no one has any bits of paper, because no one can prove either way, and it ends up being ruled that this wee girl is, in fact, a runaway slave, and is going to be taken home by this guy who is going to rape her and destroy her honour, and she's going to be forced to live as his sex slave, effectively. Um, so her dad stands up and stabs her um, and says that he would rather have a dead daughter than a dishonoured daughter um, um, <laughs> um, I don't know the appeal shot. process <laughs> first no, no. Um, uh, basically the whole story is like told in the sense that it is is incredibly admirable what he did that he would protect his family and protect her honor over protecting her life and that the family um, as a kind of facet of romanness is much more important than anything else um and you get have kind of loads and loads of examples right the way back to um brutus who killed who killed he didn't kill him he um threw out the kings the Rome, the original kings um and forced them out of Rome, but they weren't executed, they were just exiled. And Brutus became the first consul, and there was this kind of, there were occasional um, kind of rumblings of people who wanted to bring the kings back, because there's always someone who's conservative. Um, and one of those people were um, Brutus's own sons, who were conspiring to bring the kings back and reinstate the monarchy. So Brutus had them flogged to death in front of him, um and like his whole public kind of blogging to death um and there's loads of these stories of fathers basically killing their children in order to protect their honor or because their children they're adult children they're always adult or above adult uh or like you know teenage um kind of killing them in order to protect their honor or to protect the honor of the state in some way um, or if there, there's army generals, there's this army general who kills his son, who is an absolute maniac. Um, his son is amazing. He, um, does this thing where he, 
his somebody is threatening to prosecute his dad because his dad is not giving the son um a good enough career basically um and so the son rides off in the middle of the night breaks into these people's home um and threatens them until they agree to drop the lawsuit <laughs> <laughs> And that is. Don't tell me the dad then kills him for honor. He later, then does kill him because they then go to war with the Gauls. Um, and there's this whole thing with an oracle, a prophecy that there can't be any one-on-one fighting, um, until the battle, or else it'll be bad luck. Um, but the son gets into a one-on-one battle with a Gaul who is taunting him for like having shit hair or something. Um, and he rides back to his dad, who is the general, and says. Look what I did. I killed a ghoul. Aren't I great? And his dad says, no, I literally told you one thing. Don't kill a ghoul. And then has an next. Oh, you know, I've got to tell you, you've got so much humour in this book. And I'd, I'd sat there and laughed. But this whole part of killing kids was actually really horrific. Some of the things people were doing were just... Just you've got to go read the book, guys, because then you'll be just as horrified as I was. <laughs> the killing kids bit, especially the killing babies, um, because infanticide is something that always comes up. Because again, when people say like, um, "Oh, are you you know they're allowed to kill their children?" What the people imagine is not them killing their adult children, but people killing their infant children. And you have all these examples that people bring up. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine actually yesterday who has a one-year-old. Um, and he said that that bit really upset him because there's a bit where I say babies are fragile and centuries are long. <laughs> um, <laughs> because ba- basically there is this English estate where, um, 90 infant bodies were found, Roman infant bodies. Um, and a bunch of archaeologists, because you can't really trust them very much, started going around saying that this house was a brothel and that all of these uh, infants had been um killed in or because they were too because this was a brothel and sex workers didn't want the babies but this place had been inhabited for nearly 600 years as a house and this is a place where infant mortality is like one in three Mm. it's like the infant mortality rate is incredibly high um and there are you know over 600 years in a place without antibiotics and where they had and Frank- cesareans and yeah. in a place other where they believe that, stuff. you know their medical textbooks told them that women's wombs went wandering around the body looking for moisture if they weren't <laughs> kept <laughs> damp enough <laughs> like, let me guess did a man say this and they had to be kept damp by sperm uh, my god i can't believe you guessed it <laughs> uh, why am i not surprised I see where this has come up before yeah, uh, um, yeah, it has. So don't you remember the flying vaginas, the South American <laughs> flying vaginas? Oh, yeah. Well. But anyway, yeah. um, uh, so do you have any instances of women killing their children? You do, and they are more realistic because all of the ones of men killing their children are mythological, basically. Or okay. Like so far in the past, and they're written in terms of, like, look at our glorious ancestors. Why can't we be that good? Um, essentially, like, now everyone's soft and loves their children. It's like wankers. Um, but you do have women who kill their children. There's a very famous one from the second century called Pontia, um, who we mostly know about because she turns up in lots of poems, um, and she's used as an example in loads of poems by Marshall and Juvenal and satirists as like, uh, oh, I'd rather eat at Pontia's dinner table than do whatever with you. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> considered to be a hilarious joke, and far as we can tell, she killed her children um, for reasons that nobody knows. But she poisoned them, um, and was that like then it was some kind of massive trial. Um, but she's like quite obscure in terms of what she actually did. People have made up stuff for her because she appears so often. So there's like lots of very fictional examples yeah. of her life, including one from the 15th century. Actually, someone in 15th century Spain, for absolutely no reason at all, um, got a bit of stone and carved her a fake tombstone <laughs> okay. with a whole life story on it um, in Latin. That is, the, what gives it away is that the Latin is too good. Um, but it has this whole like, mad life story. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and then there's, um, like, 
fourth century scoliasts made up little stories for her as well like it's really it's quite sweet that everybody wanted to know about her but um so but she definitely killed her children and it was a scandal and a half at the time um and people were shocked and appalled and you have this woman in Smyrna who is never named but she causes a scandal because she murders her own son um but she murders her son because he killed her other child from her previous marriage um and this causes a problem because she had therefore committed a revenge killing which is fine and you're allowed to do that and is in fact strongly encouraged or no not strongly encouraged but encouraged um but also she had killed her child and that is very bad and you can't go around saying that that's okay so it causes this like the entire roman system to come to a halt and the governor who's hearing it is this guy called dolabella and he doesn't know what to do because if he says if he prosecutes her for murder or finds her guilty of like homicide of any kind then he would be saying that revenge like in certain circumstances you can't do a revenge killing um, and he can't be doing that but if he says it's okay then he'd be saying in certain circumstances you can kill your children and he can't do that so it's like this paradox so what he does is he sends it to the Areopagus which is this very very ancient Greek um, court who meet on a extremely uncomfortable hill it's not even really a hill it's like a big rock that's deeply uncomfortable to sit on um, and they there's like 12 of them and they're Athenian elders and they sit and they listen and they go, right, well, we don't want to piss off the Romans. So we can't disagree with them. Every decision is disagree with the Romans. Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, just take a recess for a little while and think about the matter. And then we'll come back in a bit. We're going to come back in a century. So in a hundred years, we'll see you here. <laughs> and we'll give you a decision then. And then that's the end of the situation. <laughs> I was going to say, if life is cheap for Romans, and it's still not okay for women to kill their kids, that's no, still it's not really like, okay. Yeah, it is. Like life is cheap in certain circumstances, and it's mostly cheap depending on how much it means to other people. So, from a societal perspective, the only lives that mean anything are lives which have both dignitas and fama. So, like a reputation and some importance in the community so if you're a consul or if you're the son of a consul or if you have any kind of government job you're a pontifex or whatever then you have an importance to the wider community that is beyond just yourself Um, and Mm -hmm. those lives have weight and meaning and it cause ripples in the kind of political structure Um, and those are the ones you tend to see in the writing that survived but ones which only cause trauma at a kind of personal level in the family are very, very private. Um, and you just don't really see those at all. It has to be something like this where it causes a genuine problem um, that like her killing her son, who is an adult, is a problem. But the it wouldn't be written down in any circumstance if it wasn't for the fact that he had killed her other son Mm. and the fact that he had killed her other son wouldn't have ever been written down if it wasn't the fact that she then revenge killed him like that is the bit that caused the problem and those bits are rare enough that they cause a bit of a ripple that we see them but the ones that are kind of personally upsetting or which cause trouble in families are so private that they just don't get written down so we don't we very rarely get to see them we only get to see kind of outliers so let's stick with that idea that, you know, they're not written down because you mentioned in your book that it's actually rare to read in ancient sources about domestic violence killings. Mm. But you have two absolutely amazing examples, one which is about Regilia, if I've pronounced her correctly. Mm-hmm. So um, tell us more about her and what happens to her, because it actually involves someone we have all heard of, doesn't it? It does, even if you don't think you've heard of him, everyone knows who he is. So Regilla, uh, or Regilla, or Regillian, is the wife of a guy called Herodes Atticus, um, who is not the world's most famous name, but he built the big, uh, the big theatre that looks very beautiful and very well preserved on the side of the, um, what's it called? Oh my god, I'm having a total blank. Big hill in Athens. 
the Acropolis. Thank you very much. Oh, my God. I was thinking Parthenon, and I cannot think of where it was on. <laughs> it's only because I saw it on a World War One caption, because they were looking at it from an artillery position. It's not because I'm smart. By the way, Alex, well done bringing in World War One into ancient history. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> There's no There's way some Greek soldiers it. staring at it. <laughs> so there is... You have the Acropolis and everything is kind of ruined, except for one very well-preserved theatre on the side where they filmed a Nest Cafe advert a couple of years ago. Um, And that theatre is very well-preserved because it's not ancient Greek, it's ancient Roman. It was built by Herodes Atticus in order, in remembrance of his wife, Regilla, um, who he had beaten to death while she was pregnant. Uh, <laughs> what a nice chap. It's almost a, like the Taj Mahal story. A bit, yeah. He is he's rubbish. Um yeah. he is someone who punched an emperor. Uh that's how like notoriously violent he is. <laughs> like he straight up punched Antoninus Pius on the top of a hill because they got into an argument. Um but he is a very, very famous and very, very, very rich Greek. Roman, Greco-Roman, so he is from an ancient Athenian family. He also has these kind of Roman um, connections that go back. He manages to marry into the, like, again, to the Claudian family through some ancestors. Um, And he marries, when he's in his late 40s, he marries a 14-year-old girl um, from a patrician family called Regilla um, and whisks her off to Rome and basically keeps her pregnant um, for her entire life. She has a lot of babies in a 10-year period. Um, And then one day she annoys him somehow, so he gets his kind of sidekick, right-hand man guy um, to punish her by beating her because he can't even be bothered to beat his own wife, um, and he accidentally beats her to death. Um, which, again, would be a kind of fairly private affair. It was, it's not something that would be written down in uh, in stories necessarily, except that um, Herodes is a philosopher and also this causes... Um, this get, he gets pulled into court because Regilla comes from a very old and very famous patrician family, um, and her brother is not about to take the fact that her, his sister has been beaten to death lying down. Like, that's just really offensive to him. So he drags Herodes off to court um, and tries to prosecute him. Unfortunately, Herodes is a trained and very talented orator and philosopher and public speaker, and Regilla's brother is a rubbisher. Um, so, and his entire prosecution is, look how old my family is, and he basically gives his, like, family tree... Um, and Herodes stands up and gives a great speech, and everybody goes, "Oh yes, well done, well done." Um, oh. as he goes off we like <laughs> well, the brother for trying, though. He did do it. He did try. He just wasn't particular. He would have been better off hiring a prosecutor, um, but he decided to do it himself. And his entire thing is basically, "Look, my family is very ancient. Um, my sister is dead. He did it. Uh, punish him." And he, Herodes' argument is, "I didn't kick her." My freedman kicked her, therefore, not me. Um, That's so horrible. Yeah, uh, it is. And they're like, yeah, fair enough. Um, but it is, um, yeah. And then Herodes goes off and builds loads and loads. He likes building monuments to people that he um, that die in suspicious circumstances around him. He has a boyfriend who is who dies. Um, who he also builds loads and loads of statues to um, and buildings, but he builds a lot of things, including that, which is called the Theatre of Rhodes Atticus, not the Theatre of Regilla. Which so he's not to. really doing it for her, is he? <laughs> it, weirdly enough, he put his own name on it. But uh, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm going to put him firmly in the dick category. He is one of those ones who's not even, like, fun, horrible. He's just quite horrible. There's a story about his son not being able to read or not learning his alphabet properly. So Herodes buys, um, like, I can't remember how many letters there are in the Greek alphabet, but say 28 boys um, and names them all letters of the alphabet um, and then has them hang out with his son so his son will learn their names. Um, so that he will then learn his alphabet. 
that's the kind of person that Herodes is. Why didn't so. you use him as an example for our down the pub? Because <laughs> Caesar's worse. It's true. He didn't genocide a million people. So. Yeah, this is true. Um, <laughs> Livia, Agrippina, the younger, and Quarter Hostilla, or Hostilia, what do all of these women have in common? Uh, they are all accused of murdering their husband. At this um, point in Roman history, uh, good on him. Yeah. Telling us. I believe that Agrippina definitely did murder her husband. Um, and um, that, I, don't, I feel like I'm pretty confident in that. Uh, Livia, I don't think, did. So Livia is the wife of Augustus, um, the first emperor. Um, and she is considered to be slightly too bossy for her own good by the odd, by some historians. Um, and so there are stories that is quite good actually. There's stories that she killed Augustus and she got around it by painting, um, figs on a tree with, um, with poison so that that, so she could get around his tasters and then he would pull the fruit off the tree. Um, and it, obviously it can be poisoned because it comes directly from the tree and eat it and it poisoned him. But he was old at this point though, wasn't he? He just died he was old age. Also in his 80s and had lived a very hard life of like a lot, 20 years of war and then 40 years of running an empire. Um, and you'd think that, and you know, again, a place where we have no, and you know, 80s is good in a place with no medicine. <laughs> um, but you'd think that that would be good enough, but no, there was a woman around, so. Uh, also people you like to accuse Livia of things as a way of casting aspersion on Augustus basically like you can't really cast aspersion on him directly but if you say his wife was horrible then it suggests that maybe he was horrible too Is it harder for a woman to get away with murdering her husband than anything else in ancient Rome? Probably, certainly a, a high any kind of high profile man who suddenly drops dead I suspect that people are going to look at the wife um, or even if they go a bit funny because they have magic they believe quite strongly in magic and witchcraft and things and curses um, so there are lots of accusations of people cursing the husbands um, but certainly anyone anyone high profile enough and you don't get more high profile than Augustus and Livia um, it helps that it was Livia's son who becomes emperor next um, Tiberius is not related by blood to Augustus. He is adopted and he is Livia's son from her first marriage. Um, and so the theory goes that he was, that um, Livia murdered him so that she could uh, her, put her son on the throne. She could have waited six months and he'd have dropped it by himself. But... Yeah, I'd be looking at him going, oh, how has he woken up again this morning? <laughs> <'Cause it is. laughs> it really needed to push it along, would you? Um, but apparently she was impatient um, and thought that he might... Well, maybe her else. womb was all dry and stuff and she just lost it. Maybe I had gone wandering around. Yeah, but... maybe. <laughs> um, yeah. Even a judgment. Um, and Courtia Hostilia is a Republican-era um, wife of a consul who, similar story, actually, uh, her husband... She is very interested in her son's career and she wants her son to become consul. Um, and so she kind of is paying for him and she's trying to run his campaigns and helping him along, but he fails several times in a row. Um, but her husband succeeds in the election. Um, her ideal is basically for her husband and her son to be consuls together because that would be like the ultimate prestige for the family. Mm. Um, so, but he fails and she's very disappointed in him. Um, and then mysteriously her husband drops dead a couple of months later. Um, and as kind of second place or like next in line, um, her son gets his position and everybody goes around saying that she murdered her husband so that her son could get a bad job. Oh dear. <laughs> so we've got two, we've got two questions. I'm going to chuck both questions just to confuse you and make life just more difficult for you. Sure. <laughs> just for fun so are there any examples of slaves killing their enslavers or vice versa how common is it for enslavers to kill their slaves uh all right very common for enslavers to kill enslaved people mm -hmm. um like distressingly so 
And you, what you see in law, for example, is um, the occasional law which makes it more difficult for them to do so, or which says, can you, like, the like, first one you get is one that says, can you not, you're no longer allowed to just send your enslaved members of your household that you don't like anymore off to be eaten by wild animals um in the arena or as food just because you're fed up with them and with no oversight there's now oversight well because um, there's a crossover isn't there because I mean, essentially i mean it's awful but they're property this is property yeah. law this not is, humanity. It is fully property law and it basically says like you can't just and it I, it's effectively regulating like how many people are going to turn up to be eaten that day. Um, and it basically says you can't just send them off for no good reason. Um, I suspect because they were probably sending off like ill and elderly um, enslaved people because mm. there is another law during the Claudius' reign which says um, stop dumping your ill and elderly enslaved people on Tiber Island because people were just rowing out there, dumping them on the island and then ro- like Oh abandoning dogs in the forest. That's, yeah, it just reminds horrible. me, McGill University, the radio station, <laughs> went across, they did this thing where they were crossing the border and punking Americans to try and make Americans look stupid. And one <laughs> of the things they did was convince a load of people, allegedly on the Harvard campus, that they were doing a petition against the ancient Canadian right of floating off your old people on <laughs> eaten by polar bears. <laughs> Oh my god! I don't know how true this is. Um, I enjoy that. Um, yeah. But this was a, an ancient Roman tradition of abandoning the enslaved members of your household who you bought and whose labour you extracted from them, and who you were now going to dump to die on an island in the middle of Rome. Um, but basically, says like you have to go to a praetor um, and make your case, and they will say yes or no. Um, and then you get ones which like you're no longer allowed to deliberately beat enslaved people to death um if it happens by accident and everybody you know who hasn't accidentally beaten someone to death so um, the traitor could <laughs> still give permission to dump granny on the island or send them off to the um to be eaten in the arena yeah do you um, know what i would be a granny collector in the roman period <laughs> you <laughs> would you'd have a house full of useless grannies exactly that you could up and saved exactly I... because i feel so bad I like the idea, actually, that there might be, like, a granny, granny savers. Yeah, like a people... Like buy- a cat cafe, but with yeah. granny. <laughs> <laughs> but Basically, like little, old people's home. Little yeah. old ladies who were stolen from their homeland in Gaul when they were 13 and have been forced to slap about Rome being enslaved. Yeah, we'll just let them flat. drink coffee and eat pasta and... Play with Sounds cats. Great. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so you get stuff like that, but you also get stuff like, um, there's an inscription from a town just outside of Rome, which is an advert for, um, like undertakers. And it's like, we will take your body and deal with it. And also, if you want, we can crucify your slaves for you. Um, sorry. It... <laughs> I'm sorry that I laughed. This is like, um, a man in a van. Yeah, it is. It's like, man trans... with a van. <laughs> it's like, craigslist for people who could come it's like it costs like you know two denarii per um per person who has to help basically um plus the cost of supplies so depending on how good you want the nails to be but yeah so you can outsource the crucifixion of your enslaved people um if you can't be asked to do it yourself oh my god that's so horrible yeah what's wrong with these people so that is constant um and and it's important to note that they do the crucifixion in the most populous parts of town as well so like in the busiest intersections um and the places where people are most likely to be like outside the gates that's where the most crucified people will be as a warning Mm. um on the other hand people killing their enslavers is very rare because there is a boo a law that comes in in the imperial period which says if one enslaved person kills their enslaver then the entire household gets crucified oh, okay. um, so if and it, a lot of the bigger houses have hundreds of enslaved people in every household people own up you know the richest people own thousands of people 
Um, so there is um, a very famous case of a guy called Secundus who is murdered by um, one of the people he has enslaved. There's no, there's two theories given by Tacitus as to why it happens. Um, one is that um, he had been promised that he would be freed um, and then that had been taken back, which is a fair enough reason to kill somebody, I reckon. Um, and the other suggestion, which Tacitus incidentally doesn't think that either of these are particularly good reasons to kill a senator, but he, mm. um, the other suggestion he gives is that um, Secundus had a sex slave, a male sex slave, um, that the murderer had fallen in love with and he was trying to save his um, the boy that he loved um, from being subjected to being Secundus's sex slave. Uh, <laughs> Pretty valid reason to off the guy, to be fair. Both reasonably valid. Systematic rape. Yeah, systematic rape or being psychologically tortured with constant promises. Oh, yeah, I'll free you, I'll free you, I'll free you, and then not. Um, either going, way, ha ha, not really. Yeah. Either way, Secundus gets stabbed. Um, and the, what happens is that the Senate says, okay, well, now all 400 members of the, of the household, um, in slavery, which includes like men, it's women, it's children of all ages, it's families, it's 400 people, um, have to be crucified. They're all going to be put to death. Um, yeah. because if we just let enslaved people kill their enslavers, then like, I don't know, like basically when they're talking to each other in the speeches that Tacitus writes out, he basically says, look, um, I've got hundreds of enslaved people at home. You've got hundreds of enslaved people at home. Everybody in this room has hundreds of enslaved people at home, not to mention all the ones on our estates. How comfortably are you going to sleep if you know that like this this massive punishment isn't going to happen basically like if yeah. you think that there's no big um like no big deterrent it's not just their life that they're going to give up but it's the life of everyone in that house well, um, presumably there's families of enslaved people under exactly. one roof as well and, so and it's, children mm, and children. children and also there is a, a long argument that goes on about whether freed slaves um so when slaves are freed um in rome they remain part of the household and quite often they still live in the household um and they're still very connected they take their enslaver's surname um and so there is a point at which freed people are going to be executed as well um and so basically the argument is look if we don't do this then none of us can sleep safely in our beds because we've all got hundreds of enslaved people who live in our houses and put our shoes on for us um and yeah. so they go, okay, yeah, sure, no, you're right. Um, and they take the, these 400 people to be executed. And the um, there's a riot, like the people of Rome who do not own hundreds of slaves each. Um, they, they riot and throw stones and throw things and try to rescue these people. And so that uh, they have to give up on the first attempt. The second attempt, they bring in the army um, to basically surround the... 400 people being crucified and all of these men women and children all 400 of them are lined up outside the gate of rome and uh, and crucified um and that is what happens if you murder the person who enslaved you basically and that's why it's rare it's why it's pretty rare mm. to see um, because you, it is not like if you were just risking yourself like you could sacrifice yourself in order to save other people or potentially change something but if you're sacrificing everyone you know <laughs> then like the romans when it's they Karen, isn't it yeah when the romans are cross about something and largely they're cross about people uh going hang on a minute that's not very fair um then they come, like, they don't just swat a fly, like, they smash that fly into the ground with a sledgehammer. Um, they do not fuck about when it comes to deterrence. So Alex managed to bring in a World War One reference. I want to bring in a World War Two reference. This is exactly what the Germans did to the Poles. You know, you're caught hiding, for example, Jew. Well, we're going to massacre the whole village. We're going to massacre your whole family. Yeah. Basically. Like, everyone. Go and then, you know, it's... 
the, a more effective deterrent because if you're the kind of person who thinks about other people and might yeah. want to rescue another person, then you're the exact kind of person who's not going to want to risk the life of every single person you know. Um, exactly. So yeah, Enough. so it's pretty one-sided to be honest. The um, Roman relationship to death and the the people that they enslaved. Emma, let's finish with something really weighty and yeah. academic. Um, and that's really going to make people think seriously about this topic. <laughs> Tell us about Lacusta and how she fits into all of this, and what is this about a giraffe? Oh, the giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was researching this, I got really obsessed with that giraffe. For really? Because <laughs> I could not work out where it had come from. It took me just, like, bear in mind I have a full-time job, like the evenings that I spent... <laughs> <laughs> obsessing about the giraffe trying to work out with the giraffe so lacusta is a very famous poisoner um from the reigns of claudius and nero and she is the woman so she allegedly comes from gaul um although no one knows if that's really true or not but she allegedly comes from gaul and she was somehow um came to the attention of the imperial family for doing some good poisoning in gaul or something no one really knows um, but she is drafted um, by the imperial family to mix poisons that um, do what they want them to do. So the Romans are really into poisons that do all kinds of different things, um, like a poison that kills slowly so that it looks like a uh, natural disease is very highly prized or a poison that kills very quickly um, so that no one has any time to do anything about it or a poison that might send someone mad before they... Uh, die so they like they're really into the kind of um intricacies of poisoning someone and apparently lacoster is very good at mixing up a poison that does what you want it to do um and she is the woman who is drafted who's picked up by agrippina in order to mix the poison to kill claudius um the story going that claudius was such a massive alcoholic and ate so much that he was impossible to poison because his metabolism just rejected poison. <laughs> um, oh, God. Which I find really funny. Um, and so, event she does manage to kill him. Um, it takes two attempts because his metabolism does not work with the mushroom one. Like, the classic story is that the um, poison was sprinkled on a very good mushroom, but apparently that didn't work, and so they had to, like, double poison him. Uh, but Everyone is so happy with that, that she's kept around and she becomes Nero's like pet poisoner. Um, and she poisons, she mixes the poison, which kills his um, adopted brother and basically anybody else that he wants got rid of. She mixes the poisons that attempts to get rid of Agrippina when Nero tries to kill her. Um, and probably also is the person providing Agrippina with antidotes to her own poison. Um, and she is... Um, about and is, is a kind of this there's these stories of her running like poison schools she's given like an estate and she gets to teach people how to mix good poisons um only she gets what's coming to her in the end well what happens is that i mean i always feel kind of bad for her because it's not like she was there like sneaking poison into people's thing into food for her own gratification it's just a job <laughs> yeah it's a job and That's it's something... a good job she can't say no to because Nero does beat people to death on a fairly regular basis. And it's like either she does it or somebody else does it and she dies. Um, so, but she, um, she does have this reputation as like a deranged serial killer, like stalking the streets of Rome, poisoning people for her sexual pleasure. But really, she's just a poor woman who was living a life in Gaul, may or may not have killed somebody, and then got dragged to Rome in order to hang out with Nero, least fun person ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not the kind of gig you want, is it? No. Um, but she is, she's kind of quite famous during her time. So when Nero falls, she is also executed. Um, but there is a story, and if you Google her, it comes up, like, you get all of these, like, oh, Lacusta... In fact, I'm going to Google her now and tell you what comes up. But it comes up as like, oh, the world's first serial killer, so Custer, killed all of these people. It's like the worst. Um, and one of the stories that comes up is that she was fucked to death by a giraffe. <laughs> I'm <Okay>. sorry. <laughs> Having <laughs> seen many giraffes trying to like even eat something near to the ground and how they just can't do it without like a hell of a lot of effort. 
I've, okay, I've just little. Googled, yeah, I've just Googled her now, and we've got, like, there's the Wikipedia, and then uh, the life and bizarre death of the necro-entrepreneur La Costa, which is a great sentence. Um, how the world's first serial killer was raped to death uh, by a giraffe. Um, and, like, it just goes on and on. And on. Was La Costa really raped to death by a giraffe? She was not raped to death by a giraffe. What? Well, it's just physically, statistically not say. possible. <laughs> I mean, like, no. seriously, if I've got a photo, I'll put it on Twitter of a oh giraffe trying to eat from a bush close to the ground. And it's hilarious. It's basically doing the splits and, like, right. trying to put how a giraffe would get down there no. to do her in the first place. I mean, someone would have to rig up a hell of a contraption to put her at the appropriate um, height. I mean, I have an idea. I have an idea. <laughs> Maybe. I'm going to launch a history hack competition for people to Maybe. figure it out. Maybe. Draw, do well, a no, drawing. No, no. <laughs> it's, it, wait. Maybe somebody dressed up as a giraffe. Have you thought of that? I hadn't thought of that. The Romans weren't massively into dressing up as things. Um, oh. but Where does this story come from? The story comes from, I eventually tracked it out to the uh, first edition from the year 2000 of a book called The Encyclopedia of Serial Killers. Um, oh, that's like, it's obviously not a first-hand account then. No. <laughs> published, <laughs> published by that notoriously excellent publisher Facts on File, um, which I think might be self-published, to be honest. Um, yeah, so eventually that's where, where I found... He just invented it. Just a man named Michael invented it and wrote it in a book. And everyone was like, yeah, With a no. seriously warped fucking mind, Michael, get help. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's where it comes from. She was not raped to death She was just, like, executed in a more normal way. Admittedly, this was the Raven, so she was probably fed to something or beaten to death. Or it would have been raven. pleasant. It wouldn't have been pleasant. But Another it wouldn't have been incessant giraffe rape. Yeah, which is pretty terrible. Which is not a thing. Um, yeah, so, God oh, bless her. Uh, she lived, like, a rubbish life being Nero's psychic and then was executed. And now, in the afterlife, she's remembered as a serial killer, which she wasn't. He was raped to death by a giraffe. Poor Lacoste. This giraffe is so <laughs> stoned that they... Why want... a giraffe? That's... I don't know, but it's like when you go... So if you go on safari, everyone's like... On the first day, you'll be like, oh, wow, it's a giraffe! On day two, you can tell the people that have been on site for a few weeks <laughs> they don't even stop for the giraffes anymore because they don't... They move so slow and they don't really do anything that interesting. They just eat. I can't imagine any giraffe summoning up enough energy to rape someone <laughs> to death. Oh, my God. They're basically like massive, long-lived koalas. They're yeah. just, everything's like, meh. 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 Yeah. I don't even, Michael Newton, whoever you are, where did you get this idea from? Get help. And why? Um, <laughs> And this is his great legacy. This is Michael Newton's great legacy, which is that he's managed to persuade everybody. <laughs> um, well, listen, thank you so much for joining us. It's always my pleasure. Oh, I oh. love how highbrow this podcast is. <laughs> well, what's it, our new tagline? It was my tagline, but we're going to adopt it. So what did they say I did? Oh, it reduces history to stupidity. Yeah, history go. is stupidity. Most it of it's... Is. It's always so stupid or horrible and it's better to laugh at it. <laughs> so I did balls and bees and now we're doing giraffe rope. Yeah. Even, I'd say, because Bertie can hear us, the cat has actually woken from his massive slumber and is looking at me like, fucking giraffe rape, what? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Even my cat is not buying it, Michael Newton. Guys, listen, you've got to go and get this book. I absolutely loved it. I laughed, cried. Felt a little bit depressed at the same time because some of the stuff is really <laughs> horrible. Where did but... you get the idea? I'll tell you exactly what it was. I was talking to a friend of mine who is a, a history teacher in America, and it was the day that the Golden State Killer was caught, and we were talking about serial killers and true crime. And um, she was saying that she uses true crime to teach like 20th century and 18th century history to high school students because it's mm. a really good way to get them involved. And I was like, oh my god, that's so good! I bet there's a really good book about Raymond murder. Um, and I went looking to find a, like, a Roman true crime book, and after two days, realised that there wasn't one, so I thought, well, I suppose I'll have to write it. Best books are when you go looking <laughs> for it, and no yeah. one's done it, and you think, well, I'll just have to write it myself. Yeah. Um, well, it's brilliant. What's it called? It's called A Fatal Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. 
buy it preferably from uh, Waterstones because <laughs> Emma yeah. works for them, or Please from an independent bookshop and and not on online mega uh, Feel free to leave me a five star review. Um, Absolutely, and if it arrives bent, don't leave her a shit review. It's nothing no. to do with the book. No, it's not my fault. I'm sorry. I and also, if you, what was your favourite review for your Agrippina book? The idiot that was like, <laughs> I bought it for someone else. One star. <laughs> it's like, oh why would you bother? Not that I resent you, person, but whoever you it. are, you're on a list with Michael Newton. <laughs> Do yeah. you know what? I said, part of me, even if we don't circulate it, we've got to get Steve, the cartoonist, to do a cartoon of Michael Lee being raped Just, to death by a giraffe. Oh, my God. <laughs> there, you, know a giraffe is, yeah, you know a giraffe is going to feature on your cartoon for yeah. this one. Yeah. Oh, no. Brilliant. We're probably going to uh, chat for quite some time yet because we have no lives and we're silly, <laughs> but uh, we'll call it a day for the podcast. Emma, we've already decided we want to do a trilogy with you about okay. mad bastard Roman emperors. We need to do yeah. Caligula, Caesar and Nero. Okay, fair. And talk about how they're just insane. You up for it? I'm up for it. Brilliant. Yeah. Join us tomorrow when Greg Valdespino will be with us to talk all about Senegal and France and colonialism. This was really good. So we started with World War One and we go all the way through as well. Um, and we talk about peanuts and why they're so important. So if you want to know why peanuts are so important in the history of Senegal, then you're going to have to join us for that. And the cartoon will be explained thoroughly. We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. One particularly great thing about it is that we have organised everything into categories. So if you just want to listen to all of our World War II shows, you can do so. Or there's ancient history or there's TV tie-ins. If you just have a hankering for famous people, so you can select what interests you the most and listen to it in one go so do go over there and subscribe don't forget you can become a patron of history hack for as little as a dollar a month just go to www.historyhack.podbean.com it will help us keep going in the aftermath of the coronavirus and we would really appreciate it as we would love to do so